World peace, world peace, or peace on earth, is the concept of an ideal state of happiness, freedom and peace within and among all people and nations on earth. This idea of world nonviolence is one motivation for people and nations to willingly cooperate, either voluntarily or by virtue of a system of governance tactics that will be solved by love and peace. Different cultures, religions, philosophies and organizations have varying concepts on how such a state would come about. Various religious and secular organizations have the stated aim of achieving world peace through addressing human rights, technology, education, engineering, medicine or diplomacy used as an end to all forms of fighting. Since 1945, the United Nations and the five permanent members of its Security Council have operated under the aim to resolve conflicts without war or declarations of war. Nonetheless, nations have entered numerous military conflicts since then. Many theories as to how world peace could be achieved have been proposed. Several of these are listed below. The term is traced back to the Roman Emperor Hadrian but the concept is as old as the recorded history. The Egyptian god Ptah says that Ramses II's strength causes every country to crave peace. In 1943, at the peak of World War II, the founder of the Pan-European Union, Richard von Kudenhove Kalergi, argued that after the war the United States is bound to take command of the skies to ensure the lasting world peace. In fact, near the entrance to the headquarters of the Sakatov at Air Base stands a large sign with a SAC emblem and its motto, Peace is our profession. The motto was a staggering paradox that was also completely accurate. One SAC bomber, Convair B-36, is called Peacemaker and one intercontinental missile LGM-118 Peacekeeper. In 2016, Former U.S. Secretary of Defense Ash Carter envisaged that the rebalance to the Asia-Pacific will make the region peaceful through strength. Introduction to U.S. National Security and Defense Strategies of 2018 States, the U.S. force posture combined with the Allies will preserve peace through strength. The document proceeds to detail what achieving peace through strength requires. Associated with peace through strength are concepts of preponderance of power, hegemonic stability theory, unipolar stability and imperial peace. World peace would be a consequence of the anarchist communist world. According to the dialectic materialist theory of Karl Marx, the humanity is divided in just two classes in capitalism, the proletarians that do not possess the means of production and the bourgeoisie that possesses the means of production, once that the communist revolution, that shall abolish the private propriety of the means of production, have happened, humanity will not be divided anymore and a lot of changes will happen. Through a period called socialism the dictatorship of the proletarians will take charge of getting rid of the last vestiges of capitalism, and help to make the revolution worldwide. Once the private propriety have been abolished worldwide, the state will not longer be useful and will disappear, because the government only exists to protect the dominant class, effectively dominating with violence and fear the submitted class, but there will not be classes anymore, and therefore none will require to dominate anyone. Instead organizations of workers will manage the production of things, but no organization will have any military power, neither police force or prisons. The main principle of Marx's theory is that the material conditions limit the spiritual conditions. People will not be violent but respecting, peaceful and altruistic, because the material conditions will finally allow them to be so. They do not longer need to live just aiming to earn money, but they live to develop themselves spiritually. With the material problems solved, and everyone receiving education and being provided the appropriate circumstances for their intellectual development, there will not any problem, and society will work getting from each one what one has the capacity to give, and providing to each one what one needs. Leon Trotsky argued that a proletariat world revolution would lead to world peace. Proponents of the democratic peace theory claim that strong empirical evidence exists that democracies never or rarely wage war against each other. There are. However, several wars between democracies that have taken place, historically. In her essay The Roots of War, Ayn Rand held that the major wars of history were started by the more controlled economies of the time against the freer ones and that capitalism gave mankind the longest period of peace in history, a period during which there were no wars involving the entire civilized world, from end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 to the outbreak of World War I in 1914, with the exceptions of the Franco-Prussian War the Spanish-American War, and the American Civil War, which notably occurred in perhaps the most liberal economy in the world at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Proponents of Cobdenism claim that by removing tariffs and creating international free trade wars would become impossible, 
because free trade prevents the nation from becoming self-sufficient, which is a requirement for long wars. However, free trade does not prevent a nation from establishing some sort of emergency plan to become temporarily self-sufficient in case of war or that a nation could simply acquire what it needs from a different nation. A good example of this is World War I, during which both Britain and Germany became partially self-sufficient. This is particularly important because Germany had no plan for creating a war economy. More generally, free trade, while not making wars impossible, can make wars, and restrictions on trade caused by wars, very costly for international companions with production, research, and sales in many different nations. Thus, a powerful lobby, unless there are only national companies, will argue against wars. Mutual assured destruction is a doctrine of military strategy in which a full-scale use of nuclear weapons by two opposing sides would effectively result in the destruction of both belligerents. Proponents of the policy of mutual assured destruction during the Cold War attributed this to the increase in the lethality of war to the point where it no longer offers the possibility of a net gain for either side, thereby making wars pointless. After World War II, the United Nations was established by the United Nations Charter to save successive generations from the scourge of war which twice in her lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. The preamble to the United Nations Charter also aims to further the adoption of fundamental human rights, to respect obligations to sources of international law as well as to unite the strength of independent countries in order to maintain international peace and security. All treaties on international human rights law make reference to or consider the principles proclaimed in the Charter of the United Nations, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family as the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. Declaration of Peace and Cessation of War with 10 Article and 38 Clauses is an international legal framework drafted by HWPL International Law Peace Committee, composed of international law experts from 15 countries. DPCW is proclaimed as a law for peace, which promotes the engagement of civil society actors, by provoking their advocacy and promoting voluntary practices of democratic values, as peace is considered difficult to be achieved only by the voice of the elites or with current institutions. The preambles of DPCW are colon 1. Prohibit the threat or use of force, 2. Reduce war potential and repurpose weapons to benefit humanity, 3. Develop friendly relations and prohibit acts of aggression, 4. Prohibit coercion against internationally recognized state boundaries, 5. Ensure the right to self-determination of peoples of states, 6. Settle international disputes through peaceful means, 7. Acknowledge the right to self-defense, 8. Foster religious freedom, 9. Promote peaceful coexistence amongst religious and ethnic groups, 10. Spread a culture of peace. Along with the global movement of support from civil society, increasing awareness and support of DPCW from former and current heads of states, civil society actors and government representatives from different countries are received such that the legal document to be submitted and introduced in the UN. Gordon B. Hinckley saw a trend in national politics by which city-states and nation-states have unified and suggests that the international arena will eventually follow suit. Many countries such as China, Italy, the United States, Australia, Germany, India and Britain have unified into single nation states with others like at the European Union following suit, suggesting that further globalization will bring about a world state. World peace has been depicted as a consequence of local, self-determined behaviors that inhibit the institutionalization of power and ensuing violence. The solution is not so much based on an agreed agenda, or an investment in higher authority whether divine or political but rather a self-organized network of mutually supportive mechanisms, resulting in a viable politico-economic-social fabric. The principal technique for inducing convergence is thought experiment, namely backcasting, enabling anyone to participate no matter what cultural background, religious doctrine, political affiliation or age demographic. Similar collaborative mechanisms are emerging from the Internet around open-source projects, including Wikipedia, and the evolution of other social media. Economic norms theory links economic conditions with institutions of governance and conflict, distinguishing personal clientelist economies from impersonal market-oriented ones, identifying the latter with permanent peace within and between nations. 
Through most of human history societies have been based on personal relations, individuals and groups know each other in exchange favors. Today in most lower income societies hierarchies of groups distribute wealth based on personal relationships among group leaders, a process often linked with clientelism and corruption. Michael Musso argues that in this kind of socio-economy conflict is always present, latent or overt, because individuals depend on their groups for physical and economic security and are thus loyal to their groups rather than their states, and because groups are in a constant state of conflict over access to state coffers. Through processes of bounded rationality, people are conditioned towards strong in-group identities and are easily swayed to fear outsiders, psychological predispositions that make possible sectarian violence, genocide, and terrorism. Market-oriented socio-economies are integrated not with personal ties but the impersonal force of the market where most individuals are economically dependent and trusting strangers and contracts enforced by the state. This creates loyalty to a state that enforces the rule of law and contracts impartially and reliably and provides equal protection and the freedom to contract, that is, liberal democracy. Wars cannot happen within or between nations with market-integrated economies because war requires the harming of others, and in these kinds of economies everyone is always economically better off when others in the market are also better off, not worse off. Rather than fight, citizens in market-oriented socio-economies care deeply about everyone's rights and welfare, so they demand economic growth at home and economic cooperation and human rights abroad. In fact, Nations with market-oriented socio-economies tend to agree on global issues and not a single fatality has occurred in any dispute between them. Economic norms theory should not be confused with classical liberal theory. The latter assumes that markets are natural and that freer markets promote wealth. In contrast, economic norms theory shows how market contracting is a learned norm, and state spending, regulation, and redistribution are necessary to ensure that almost everyone can participate in the social market economy which is in everyone's interests. One proposed mechanism for world peace involves consumer purchasing of renewable and equitable local food and power sources involving artificial photosynthesis ushering in a period of social and ecological harmony known as the Sustainacy. The International Day of Peace, sometimes called World Peace Day, is observed annually on 21 September. It is dedicated to peace, and specifically the absence of war and violence and can be celebrated by a temporary ceasefire in a combat zone. The International Day of Peace was established in 1981 by the United Nations General Assembly. Two decades later, in 2001, the General Assembly unanimously voted to designate the day as a day of preventing violence and a ceasefire. The celebration of this day is recognized by many nations and people. In 2013, for the first time, the day has been dedicated to peace education, i.e. by the key preventive means to reduce war sustainably. Many religions and religious leaders have expressed a desire for an end to violence. The central aim of the Baha'i faith is the establishment of the unity of the peoples of the world. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, stated in no uncertain terms, the fundamental purpose animating the faith of God and his religion is to safeguard the interests and promote the unity of the human race, in his writings. Baha'u'llah described two distinct stages of world peace, a lesser peace and a most great peace. The lesser peace is essentially a collective security agreement between the nations of the world. In this arrangement, nations agree to protect one another be rising up against an aggressor nation, should it seek the usurpation of territory or the destruction of its neighbors. The lesser peace is limited in scope and is concerned with the establishment of basic order and the universal recognition of national borders and the sovereignty of nations. Baha'is believe that the lesser peace is taking place largely through the operation of the divine will, and that Baha'i influence on the process is relatively minor. The most great peace is the eventual end goal of the lesser peace and is envisioned as a time of spiritual and social unity, a time when the peoples of the world genuinely identify with and care for one another, rather than simply tolerating one another's existence. The Baha'is view this process as taking place largely as a result of the spread of Baha'i teachings principles and practices throughout the world. The larger world peace process and its foundational elements area addressed in the document The Promise of World Peace, written by the Universal House of Justice. Many Buddhists believe that world peace can only be achieved if we first establish peace within our minds. The idea is that anger and other negative states of mind are the cause of wars and fighting. Buddhists believe people can live in peace and harmony only if we abandon negative emotions such as anger in our minds and cultivate positive emotions such as love and compassion. As with all Dharmic religions, Ahimsa is a central concept.
Fact, peace pagodas are monuments that are built to symbolize and inspire world peace and have been central to the peace movement throughout the years. These are typically of Buddhist origin, being built by the Japanese Buddhist organization Nippon San Myohoji. They exist around the world in cities such as London, Vienna, New Delhi, Tokyo, and Lumbini. The basic Christian ideal specifies that peace can only come by the word and love of God, which is perfectly demonstrated in the life of Christ. As Christologically interpreted from, whereupon the word of the Lord is established on the earth, the material human political result will be nation no taking up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Christian world peace necessitates the living of a proactive life replete with all good works sign direct light of the word of God. The details of such a life can be observed in the Gospels, especially the historically renowned Sermon on the Mount, where forgiving those who do wrong things against oneself is advocated among other pious precepts. However, not all Christians expect a lasting world peace on this earth. Many Christians believe that world peace is expected to be manifest upon the new earth that is promised in Christian scripture such as the Roman Catholic religious conception of consecration of Russia, related to the church's high priority Fatima Marian apparitions, promises world peace as a result of this process being fulfilled. Traditionally, Hinduism has adopted an ancient Sanskrit phrase Vasudha which translates as the world is one family. The essence of this concept is the observation that only base minds see dichotomies and divisions. The more we seek wisdom, the more we become inclusive and free our internal spirit from worldly illusions or maya. World peace is hence only achieved through internal means, by liberating ourselves from artificial boundaries that separate us all. As with all Dharmic religions, ahimsa is a central concept. According to Islamic eschatology, the whole world will be united under the leadership of Prophet Isa in his second coming. At that time, love, justice, and peace will be so abundant that the world will be in likeness of paradise. The concept of tikkun olam is central to modern rabbinic Judaism. Tikkun olam is accomplished through various means, such as ritualistically performing God's commandments, charity, and social justice, as well as through example persuading the rest of the world to behave morally. According to some views, Tikkun Olam would result in the beginning of the Messianic Age. It has been said that in every generation, a person is born with the potential to be the spiritual Messiah. If the time is right for the Messianic Age within that person's lifetime, then that person will be the Mashiach. But if that person dies before he completes the mission of the Messiah, then that person is not the Messiah. Specifically, in Jewish Messianism it is considered that at some future time a Messiah will rise up to bring all Jews back to the land of Israel followed by everlasting global peace and prosperity. This idea originates from passages in the Old Testament and the Talmud. Compassion for all life, human and non-human, is central to Jainism. They have adopted the wordings of Lord Mahir Geo Our Gino do human life is valued as a unique, rare opportunity to reach enlightenment, to kill any person, no matter what crime he may have committed, is considered unimaginably abhorrent. It is a religion that requires monks and laity, from all its sects and traditions, to be vegetarian. Some Indian regions, such as Gujarat, have been strongly influenced by Jains and often the majority of the local Hindus of every denomination have also become vegetarian. Famous quote on world peace is per Jainism by a 19th century Indian legend, Virgin Gandhi, may peace rule the universe, may peace rule in kingdoms and empires, may peace rule in states and in the lands of the potentates, may peace rule in the house of friends and may peace also rule in the house of enemies. As with all Dharmic religions, Ahimsa is a central concept. Peace comes from God. Meditation, the means of communicating with God, is unfruitful without the noble character of a devotee, there can be no worship without performing good deeds. Guru Nanak stressed now here at Karo, that a Sikh should balance work, worship, and charity, and should defend the rights of all creatures, and in particular, fellow human beings. They are encouraged to have a Charti Kala, or optimistic, resilience, view of life. Sikh teachings also stress the concept of sharing, Vanchako through the distribution of free food at Sikh Gurdwaras, giving charitable donations, and working for the good of the community and others. Sikhs believe that no matter what race, sex, or religion one is, all are equal in God's eyes. Men and women are equal and share the same rights, and women can lead in prayers. As with all Dharmic religions, Ahimsa is a central concept. A report in June 2015 on the Global Peace Index highlighted that the impact of violence on the global economy reached 14.3 trillion U.S. dollars. 
The report also found that the economic cost of violence is 13.4% of world GDP, equal to the total economic output of Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Spain and the UK combined. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.